So we'll go ahead and complete our review of uh, CPU scheduling. And uh, then we'll be ready to take up interests for the next assessment. Now, I, I do want to share with you that I did take to heart uh, some constructive feedback by students who completed uh, course or, or instructional, it's student evaluation of instruction at the end of the semester. So in, in the previous year, students last season provided some suggestions for improvement. And one thing that I determined is that I have to have all of the assignments and and uh, solutions uh, scored and everything in place with the first module. So what we're gonna do is post the module one assessment retake and post uh, scores and credit for everything that was turned in for module one. And then uh, by Wednesday noon, we'll put the assessment out, the first attempt of the module two material because the goal is to complete that today. But if there are uh, minor delays in putting the assessment out for module two, I vowed, I promised that uh, this season would be different and that I would return uh, and score credit uh, for every, everything that's been submitted before the next assessment was um, posted online. And I just thought that I would share with you that um, I know in recent seasons, fewer students have participated in student evaluation of courses, but uh, good, bad, and ugly, we always get uh, feedback that's useful to refine our process. And I wanna thank everyone who has participated in that in the past. And uh, that said, I would also like to mention that if you have suggestions for improving process here and now, in our course, um, I welcome, and it, you know it's a good thing to hear this up front because there are some things we can do on the fly as we continue. Um, so we're always interested in hearing how to do better or ways to try different things. And, and I wanted to be sure everybody understood that before we continued. Any questions before we, we move forward? So I have a bit of a stubborn screen here. This is something that we shared in our last class. So at the end of the last class, we were talking about um, how a simple diagram called a Gantt chart is used to understand certain options for CPU scheduling, right? Algorithms for CPU scheduling. And one of the scheduling uh, algorithms that's commonly deployed in most operating systems is this idea of priority scheduling, where a process is run first based on its assignment of priority. You may or may not know this, but in task manager, you can assign certain services or processes on your system with a higher level of priority so that they execute uh, sooner if, if you notice that there are some performance issues. So here you see that with priority scheduling, the average wait time for each of the processes is changed. Um, so there are trade-offs with each of the CPU scheduling algorithms and what happens is that the average wait time for all processes changes as a result of that algorithm. And it's important to understand which algorithms may be best suited for given scenarios. You may be faced with a scenario in your module assessment where we talk about a scenario where a given service or process um, is creating bottlenecks and lags. And we'll also explain that there are 
other interests in the mix that point to this particular version of scheduling as the preferred method of scheduling. And so, um, you know, there was, can anyone remember or recall the names of any of the other CPU scheduling algorithms we've reviewed to, to date? Any of them? Or just the initials, just the algorithm, just the acronym? So this is priority scheduling, but before this, we reviewed a couple of other scheduling algorithms that are common. It's called uh, first come, first serve. Anybody remember first come, first serve? So, yeah. okay. Round robin. Round robin is, uh, okay, so there are two contexts for round robin. There is round robin CPU scheduling. And we have talked about clustered servers before, right? Haven't we mentioned that, that um, operating systems can include resources for clustered services? Anyone? Server clusters? Does it ring a bell? I'm, I'm not, not hearing anything from... No. Uh, it doesn't ring a bell to me. Doesn't, doesn't ring a bell? Uh, we talked about client server, right? Please say yes. I'm going to think I'm in the wrong class if that's not the case. We did, we did talk about client server, right? And there are cases where you can create uh, like parallel computing. We covered some things about parallel and matrix computing, right? In that context, did we not? In our first module? Okay. I remember that. So when you distribute computing, so if we did not intentionally cover server clusters, when you're distributing a computing load, distributed and matrix computing is often split apart. We did cover multi-core and multi-processor, and you can also have multi-server. Um, so you can create... Um, you can create round robin scenarios between servers, between systems. Uh, I just wanted to call out the fact that you'll hear the term round robin in other contexts. So you do have a round robin uh, method that helps distribute the computing load. So when you're dealing with distributed computing loads between systems, round robin is a favorite a good example of round robin configuration for a server cluster or, or for um, network load balancing. So another flavor of distributed computing between servers is called network load balancing, NLB. And in particular, DNS is um, a great example of round robin. How many of you were aware that uh, DNS is an Achilles heel for Active Directory environments or for large technology corporations like Google and Amazon and Apple and, right? DNS, that, that you can cripple an organization if they're, if the DNS service or DNS servers are slow. So it's typical for a Google or an Amazon or an Apple, a Facebook to have DNS servers that number in the hundreds, hundreds of servers, right? So uh, DNS servers work in tandem to respond to resolution requests for name service, right? 
So you have a domain name and that is that creates a heavy load when it comes to web-based activity, when it comes to cloud apps, and in particular, email and messaging, right? Because uh, domain name is in the mix. This same concept, so it, you'll recall that when it came to distributing compute, distributed computing, there's multi-threaded computing within the same system. You can have a computing task split between cores. You can have computing tasks split between CPUs. And there's overhead, Amdahl's law. Does everybody remember Amdahl's law? Amdahl, A-H-M-D-A or A-M-D-H-A-L, yeah? Basically, when you double processors, you don't get a doubling of productivity. There's overhead for splitting a computing load. Does that ring a bell? Okay. Well, as you prepare to retake uh, the final version of the module one assessment, you might, might want to brush up on that. Just saying. Okay. So um, in the same manner that you can distribute computing tasks, within the same CPU, between CPUs and between systems, you have this same phenomenon where you have these round robin algorithms that exist within a single CPU. And then you can have between CPUs and then between systems in a cluster or for network load balancing. So the goal there is to basically even out and distribute uh, computing interests so that you have, you know, uh, a smoother and more balanced um, performance between tasks. Um, so each process gets a small unit of CPU time. And uh, basically, the CPU keeps revolving around in a huge circle, taking care of the next cycle, the next cycle, the next cycle uh, for a variety of tasks. So, so the goal is to split up a split up a necessary service or task into smaller pieces, and then the CPU basically does a, an iterative or cyclical cyclical thing where it incrementally performs the next step in a series of tasks for each of the um, each of those. Uh, processes that are involved in the round robin. So if you have um, if you have too many of those, that creates a problem. Um, but basically when it comes to critical tasks, this is one CPU scheduling method that um, is preferred because no process waits very long for incremental uh, steps to be performed. So what are we saying? When it comes to mission critical services where there needs to be uh, a consistent baseline of performance, if you were to structure those to, to run under round robin, uh, that would solve a lot of problems as opposed to having to scrap for priorities or first come first serve. So, so round robin would be considered like a more advanced approach, but here you see that, um, you know, Q must be large with respect to the context switch, otherwise the overhead is too high. So what does that mean? There are scenarios where a round robin uh, creates a bottleneck of its own. If, if you have uh, too many and too much um, services and processes in the mix. So you don't want to have the, the Q represents the quantum of time. You don't want your time interval so small that, um, that you can't perform an adequate amount of interest for each of the processes and services. Otherwise it's herky-jerky and you keep switching between tasks. And so your context switching between services so much that, that that part of the overhead is too high. Does anyone have any question about this? 
No. So there's a trade-off. More services get more attention and uh, there's equity between the processes, but, but you can't have too many of the processes and you can't make the time interval so small. So, so there's a limit. So what happens if on a single CPU, you uh, run out of resources for the given number? Well, then you run multi-core. I mean, you, you run multi-socket. You have multiple CPUs, each with multiple cores. And then you run clusters. You, you have multiple servers. And you run round robin between the servers for network load balancing or for clustered performance. So, so here's an example of how round robin with a time quantum equal to four. So time quantum means Q equals to four. You, you can basically execute uh, a consistent interest for each of those processes. So says typically a higher average turnaround than SJF, but better response. So this just explains that uh, when you're working round robin and time quantums that the overhead the overhead that you're dealing with here is switching between uh, between tasks, right? So for a long task, you're going to have you're going to have to return back to that one task more times, and it's going to involve more context switch times for that longer task. What are we saying? In other CPU scheduling algorithms, when you get to a long task it has CPU resources for a longer continuous period of time. And it's not start stopping, start stopping, start stopping. So in particular, longer for, for tasks that require resources longer, uh, round robin's gonna create more delays for, for longer and for, for longer services or longer tasks for a service to execute as opposed to other processes that are designed to, to work in, in short bursts or increments. So it all depends on how it, put another way, the mix of applications and how the services are designed to function. So what's the takeaway from, from this review? Operating systems can be fine tuned. You can, you can tune an operating system kernel for a given context or a given set of applications based on the design or vice versa. You could build into your solution development um, an understanding for a specific, to, you know, you design an application to perform particularly well with a given CPU scheduling algorithm. And, and, and that's, that's the other side of this, is that you have application developers that need to fine tune their applications, given an understanding of CPU scheduling algorithms. And then you also have operating system developers who can fine tune or tweak uh, CPU scheduling for a given mix of applications. Um, this is the kind of stuff that you see happening all the time under the hood in the back room at Facebook and at Amazon and at Google where high performance computing for millions of people constantly is a big thing. Um, these kinds of discussions and, and uh, adjustments are made on the fly in real time. So if you're doing round robin, the turnaround time varies with the time quantum so based on the length of the tasks associated with a given service, you're gonna find that uh, round robin is better for some and worse for others. And uh, another CPU uh, scheduling algorithm is multi-level queue. 
So you have foreground and background. You see a lot of this in mobile devices and in the Android operating system. So I don't know if you remember a reference to foreground and background um, context in module one, but uh, multi-level queue is something that's particularly relevant for the Android operating system. So here you see first come first served in the background and round robin for the foreground. So this is just one way to create a multi-level queue. So a multi-level queue would be a way of organizing the processes and services that are in the mix and then defining specific CPU scheduling algorithms for uh, where they're staged, foreground and, and background. It says the scheduling must be done between the queues, fixed priority scheduling, time slices. Um, so here you see 20% to background in FCFS. 80% in the foreground. Does 20, 80, 80, 20 ring a bell anywhere? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The 80, 20 rule. Yeah. Yeah. Here you see, here you see this 80, 20 thing in the mix again. So here you see um, just another diagram that helps explain multi-level queue scheduling where you have highest priority and lowest priority. Um, and that's consistent with what we've reviewed at this point in the course. When you see low level system uh, interests, those are highest priority, highest privilege, closest to the hardware, most unstable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you get further out from that level, you're out in the application arena. It's interesting they have student, use of the word student here. Multi-level feedback queue. So whenever you have a multi-level scheduling algorithm, um, a part of making that work smoothly is to include a feedback mechanism where some adjustments can automatically be defined. And um, of course, that means you have to have indexing in queues so that you can constantly assess um, execution status, priority, priority levels, and so on. In most systems, in most operating systems, the mix of applications changes on the fly, right? So it just makes sense that you would have some kind of feedback mechanism in a multi-level queue, and, and that that's an important component of multi-level. Because as the mix of applications changes between foreground and background, right? the queues and wait times and all that kind of stuff changes with it. I do not expect you to uh, I do not expect you to be able to explain or uh, field questions about uh, this particular slide but it's just good information to know where it shows um, how different cues in the mix interact with each other. So it gets, it gets pretty complex. This is the stuff that blue screens and CPU crashes, you know, system crashes, OS crashes are made of. It's also the reason why it's really good to be able to work debugging mode sometimes. So um, you can usually find information about what's happening and where in 
system logs on a much more granular level if you're working in debug mode. But uh, hang on. Okay, yep, we had a urgent student interest there. And um, so they're gonna call back after class. Sorry about the interruption. Thread scheduling. Before we get into thread scheduling, are there any questions about multi-level CPU uh, scheduling algorithms? Or any questions about round robin? Are, are we there? Is everybody here? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, of course, uh, when it comes to CPU scheduling, uh, a piece of that has to do with threads, right? since threads are a component of processes. And um, especially when you're dealing with multi-threaded scenarios, you have to have a graceful way of, of scheduling CPU resources for threads and not just uh, processes or services. So um, the important thing to understand is that um, there are distinctions and different methods to accommodate threads, right? And here it says uh, process contention scope. So a lot of it depends on the context. In our previous reviews of uh, process and threads, we talked about many to one and many to many models. So a, a lot of the uh, thread scheduling is is defined in scopes that has to do with the context. So it's many to one and, and, and many to many. And um, one to one is very simple. So the interest in thread scheduling is greatly reduced in terms of simple scenarios. But when you have these very rich, very robust multi-threaded scenarios, you have to have um, a different way of managing that process. So um, if you have a multi-threaded kernel level interests, here it says system contention scope. If, if you have a situation where a multi-threaded scenario requires uh, better access to CPU resources, uh, one thing to look at is this notion about system contention scope. You're, you're on a very low level within the kernel and, and there's a contest or conflict for resources, so one of the one of the things you want to look at is is um, the system contention scope for thread scheduling as a way to resolve that. Um, so that's something we can glean from this slide. P thread scheduling that again has to do with the POSIX standard, and so here it's. Um, providing you with some examples of how thread scheduling works for a POSIX compliant system. So, mm 
And this is just an example of some coding for a pthread scheduling. Um, I'm trying to pick out something that would be obvious. That's the thread identity. Yeah. All right, so this is just a handy example. I would not expect you to be able to identify that this has to do with. Um, now, in this case, <clears throat> you see the word set scheduling algorithm and then threads. So obviously this has something to do with thread scheduling. It's just a coding example. It's provided for you to be familiar with, not to memorize or anything. So multiprocessor scheduling, here we're talking about a system that has multiple sockets on the motherboard. We're not talking about a single CPU with multiple cores that are hyper-threaded. We're talking about when you have more than one CPU on a system board. So you see this example of asymmetric processing versus symmetric processing. It may be useful to recall the different methods of, of processing with um, CSC 241. So uh, for this module, I may, do we have an addendum for this module? Let me just check and see if there's an addendum. There is an addendum. I may revise the addendum to include um, the taxonomy from the last module of CSC 241, where they talked about the symmetric multiprocessing methods, um, just to supplement this material here. So there are distinctions where you can work a criteria known as affinity and you can designate a given um, process, an interest with a specific processor. And um, that's part of the management scenario. So in this context, when you have more than one socket, you have more than one CPU, you see this, um, you see an interest here that has to do with processor affinity. And I keep saying the word trade-off. Um, you can have a process associated with a CPU, but uh, that that can, under certain circumstances, cr create some context issues. So essentially, what are we saying? You can improve things by working um, affinity as a part of your CPU scheduling when you have more than one CPU, but that also means that other um, executions and memory allocations and so on are, are diverted to that CPU. So using affinity to designate a specific processor to handle certain services and tasks can be good or it can, or it can cause problems depending on the rest of the context in, in the application and on your system. So th that's just one observation and caution I'm going to repeat um, along the way here. We talked about uh, load balancing and the idea that uh, server clusters 
are intended to distribute the computing load between systems. And you have a similar interest in load balancing between processors when you have more than one processor on a system. So everybody's familiar with the what the word push and pull means, right? Push and pull concepts. Yeah. So when when you're distributing the computing load, a processor can pull waiting tasks from a busy processor. So that would be a pull migration. Or a processor that's too busy can push its tasks off to another CPU. So these are really granular considerations for how best to implement a load balance scenario. But essentially, you see a you see both of these uh, methods used to help with the load balancing, so that so that uh, each CPU can do its part to reduce the overall computing load. And again, there's overhead associated with all of this. So whenever you have additional methods to distribute the computing load, you have to be careful that the overhead associated with those methods doesn't eat up too much uh, resource on its own. I can't tell you I know uh, which one's more prevalent, push or pull. I just I just know that's part of uh, the load balancing. So multi-core processors, the latest trend is let's not have multiple processors. Um, let's just have more cores on the same physical chip. And recently we've seen as many as 32, 48, 64 cores on the same physical chip. This is taken to an extreme with risk processors when it comes to uh, graphical performance for floating point calculations, in particular, the gaming industry and high performance computing. So GPUs have simpler cores, but more of them, many more of them. It's, um, everybody remembers a view of the Intel chip from CSC 241, where we had an Intel i7 and it had four cores and then it was sitting next to an NVIDIA graphics processor. And that thing had like 540 cores. Does every rem anyone remember that? I can't recall. Okay, I'm gonna do this just to, I think this would be worth, I think this would be worth doing just for a moment here. Uh, let's see if it's in here. Yes. So this was the taxonomy I was talking about before. Does everybody remember this? Flynn's taxonomy, single instruction, single data, single instruction, multiple data, multiple instruction, single data, multiple instruction and multiple data, right? For distributed computing interests. And then, um, uh, there is that CPU diagram. It's not in here. It's not blade to cloud. So here's a, uh, this gets crazy, but you can have a, a daughter card. This is 
and it's sometimes referred to as a blade. And here you see a CPU socket and a CPU socket. And this blade is, you slide this into a chassis. So you can basically have, this is an entire server with dual socket, right? So you have a Xeon processor and a Xeon processor and all the RAM. You just don't have the disk with it and you have lots of IO. So in order to condense, um, and all right, so how is this relevant with our current interest? The, in data centers where you have to work very high computing loads, the operating system has to efficiently work CPU scheduling. And obviously the more CPUs you have, the greater the challenge to distribute efficiently that load. Um, so we're kind of straddling the fence with what we were, uh, let's look at one more thing here. IOT phenomenon, might be in the previous, uh, might be in the previous, no, yeah, it's in the previous one. Let's look in module five. There we go. CPU types, build your own. So I, I think this is one thing that would be good to include in our review of, of um, process and services and threads and CPU scheduling because the world is is moving in the direction of risk. So you're seeing a, a, a lot more stuff coming from chip fabrication facilities. They're not called factories, they're fabrication facilities because it looks like you're doing something with NASA. You know, everybody has to have these um, environmental control suits. You have to keep dust and hair and uh, all sorts of things out under control, but um, uh, so th this was something that we showed uh, students in 241 in our last, that's not it either. Let's look in here. You have a whole different uh, challenge. Come on, come on. This is gonna drive me nuts here because there we go. That's the one. So the trend uh, in recent years is to include more cores in a single chip. And this would be like an Intel i5 processor, right? And this is, this is literally an NVIDIA uh, graphics processor, right? With 240 cores. So uh, is, it, is it hard to tell which one is, um, it's the general instrument set, the common instrument set CISC, that would be this one, right? You have a wider range of computing interests that have to be, accommodated so the circuitry in the chip, the cores on the chips are larger, right? So they're general purpose and, and these are more for floating point calculation. So we're rendering graphics or we're performing uh, supercomputing calculations, right? So the NVIDIA Tesla GPU that's mounted onto daughter cards is capable of producing huge numbers of, you know, teraflops billions and trillions of calculations per second. And if it has anything to do with computing intensity, um, 
So operating systems would have to be finely tuned to accommodate the number of cores and how to distribute. I hope that was helpful. Um, a quick walk down memory lane. And I hope that as long ago as you took 241, that some of that looked familiar. So the trend is to place multiple process cores. You can nowadays, if you have a graphics controller on your Windows 10 machine, the latest versions of the operating system allow you to right click and run a task exclusively on the GPU. And what that means is that you're taking advantage of the additional cores. So it's an option to use um, more efficiently all of the different cores. And um, so obviously multi-threading on a multi-core system, the CPU scheduling is its own special area of interest. And some that are software driven and others that are hardware driven. But this concept of an interrupt, we're going to get into quite heavily um, in our next module. Interrupts are a way to keep things from crashing. So the greater the number of threads and the greater number of cores in a CPU, um, greater the interest in managing the CPU scheduling and this, this thing called conflict phase of dispatch latency. So you have to be careful. Um, the latest trend means that you have to be more careful about how you distribute tasks and schedule the CPU. This uh, should sound familiar. We were just talking about priority scheduling but now we're talking about priority scheduling for threads and a multi-core CPU. So <clears throat> you have these same concepts that you see over and over again, right? You have preemptive scheduling versus, um, <clears throat> versus uh, round robin kinds of things. Uh, I'm not even going to go here with virtualized PC CPUs. So virtual processors and a virtual machine, essentially in the interest of time and sanity, I'm going to claim that, um, CPU scheduling in a virtual machine is not conceptually that different from CPU scheduling in a physical machine. And uh, I'm not sure that, that this is particularly relevant material to worry about right now. I, I think you're gonna find that the operating system that's running on a virtual machine is gonna operate in a manner that's consistent with um, others, except for hyper one visors, where you may have different prioritization for different virtual machines, but there's a way to set that. Um, so yeah, I'm not even going to get into the weeds with this with you. Okay. Um, POSIX is not I'm going to go ahead and pull some quick examples for each of these operating systems out and include that with the new material that we uh, amend to the uh, study guide addendum. Okay. So this is where we'll stop. And I'll just include some Linux and Windows scheduling examples as a part of the other stuff from CSC 241 we just reviewed. So I'll extract that and add that to the end of the addendum. Are there any questions before we close? Uh, no questions. So this concludes our review of CPU scheduling. And uh, 
when you get a moment, just check out the additional material we're going to add to the addendum and we'll see you on Thursday. Thanks again for joining us.